On this week's episode, we are delighted to have one of the world's top portrait and entertainment photographers on the show. Art Stryber joins us all the way from sunny LA. He shares some tips on lighting, preparation and productivity, and we talk everything from turkey bags to time management. So sit back, plug in and enjoy. Do you want to start? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Hello, <Yeah>. everyone. <laughs> How are you, Greg? I'm good. I'm good. I am um, sat alone in the studio. It's dark outside. I mean, you know how I started doing this at the beginning of the podcast. Painting. Yeah, I don't know why you started yeah. describing it. Painting a picture Great. for the listeners. I can hear the tinkle of the rain on the skyline. Tell them what you're wearing. <laughs> Steady on. You can Sorry. see. Uh, for the for the record, this episode is now X-rated. Hmm. Uh, it's not actually it's all it's, hidden behind the pop shield anyway it's all hidden behind the pop shield um so on today's episode we are incredibly lucky and fortunate to uh, be joined by uh, the legend really that is art striver from la uh, it's an amazing chat and art is incredibly generous with his time and knowledge uh, but we kind of wanted to start off do a little bit of uh, our chat beforehand and it, really i wanted to start off Greg, if you'll in, if you'll indulge me with a bit of a tech PSA, which is a bit of you a public, doing I tech. Know, I know, sorry, <laughs> sorry, but for the the more tech uh, enabled people, that's not right. <laughs> for the for more technical among you, um, you might have seen that Apple have announced some new Macs, uh, which is important for a couple of reasons. Now, bear with me, hear me out. And don't switch off or skip, obviously. Um, but the Macs, have for years, have you been using Intel technology? They moved over from their own chips years ago, but they're now moving back to their own chips, which is interesting because if you are thinking, and this is why it's PSA, if you are thinking about upgrading your machines, just hold off. Because if you buy an Intel machine now, it is going to be made obsolete very, very quickly because they've announced the 13-inch MacBook Pro. There'll be a 15-inch, I'm sure, that joins soon after. Um, and this, these chips are going to require the software to be recoded. They're not, you know, there will be a, a porting uh, thing, but a uh, porting app. But for the majority of stuff, you'll need uh, the apps to be rewritten to run natively on Big Sur. So if you are thinking... About this upgrading is their your, M1, right? Uh, this is new, the M1, the new, the new Apple Silicon. Silicon stuff. It's 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 actually a very exciting thing because we're talking about you know them being able to control the process from start to finish, and we're talking about higher uh, higher power. We're also talking about them not having to necessarily throttle the processors because of heat. So we're talking about lower heat thresholds on the on the devices. It is it is a, an interesting move, um, but hold off or, or look into it. And um, because you don't want to be spending a huge amount of money now on a, a laptop that might be made obsolete in the next six months. To be honest, so, you probably don't want to be spending a huge amount of money now, regardless. No, currently. <laughs> so let me, this is a PSA within a PSA. Uh, yeah, anyone who's spending a lot of money, ixnay on that spending, hombre. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a pandemic. Um, so, yes. Did you want to talk about Google? um the googly uh no i mean i well i do but i don't know anything about it Tom. do you want to throw do you want to throw it back to me so i'm going to throw that little <laughs> nugget back in your proverbial court excellent so i'm, I'm mixing my I'm, metaphors you can't throw a nugget can you i was going to say i'm i don't know if i'm glad to receive that nugget or not i'm, <laughs> I'm going to i'm going to say no <laughs> lob, lob of discus so yes, I'll catch the proverbial discus. The interesting thing about you might have seen it a couple of weeks ago, Google announced that they are going to kill off their unlimited storage plan for high quality and high res files, um, which I'm sure that will affect uh, various people who are using that for their offsite data storage. Um, we also thought as kind of a, 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 a bit of a PSA again, but all these services that tend to offer unlimited storage, as we can see by Google's case, they'll be unlimited for a certain amount of time. And then when you've uploaded a certain amount, then they, they possibly might become expensive. So um, 
we thought actually w- would it be helpful if we did an episode upon uh, you know about storage uh, and how we kind of run our offsite backups and our libraries and our databases and and things like that so if if you would like us to do one granted it might be a bit techy and probably won't be our most listened to episode but if you would like us to do an episode about hard drives and storage and all the fun stuff that comes with that uh, then please drop us a message drop us an email drop us a comment and let us know. Um, we will probably do it anyway, but uh, it would be good to gauge how much interest there is because obviously we it's not the most sexy of topics. Oh. There we go. And that is <laughs> that is a genuinely authentic sound effect. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm back in the room. I'm back in the room. Back in the room. So do you want to get straight into it? Because honestly, I this chat with Art is gold. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I always say this, but this really what this really is like, I'm the stuff in here that I heard for the first time, I was just like, oh, wow, that is totally made me rethink the way um, I'm going to approach shoots in the future. Mm. Um, I mean, also the fact that you managed to mention your bag of dicks was was probably I a was first incredibly, on the podcast. I was incredibly proud of that. Incredibly proud. I, it's been a while since we've mentioned genitalia, so glad to get one in. Well, you've got a whole bag of them in, but anyway. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm sure you're listening. I'm very sorry for talking about my bag of dicks. And here we go. On today's show, we are incredibly lucky to be joined by Art Stryber, who is one of the leading portrait and entertainment photographers based out of Los Angeles uh, in the US. Art, how are you? Uh, I am stoked to be here. That is that is very generous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, it's a uh, beautiful blue sky day in Southern California, and um, uh, I, I'm happy to join you guys. I love what you guys have been up to. Oh, thank you very much. And obviously, congratulations on on getting a, quite a big result because obviously in the last episode we had no idea what the result would be and uh, and now you have a, a new president elect and a vice president elect and uh, it's pretty it feels like things are you know obviously it's going to be an odd transition but it does feel like things are starting to get a bit more hopeful right uh, a little bit yeah one step at a time you know it, it's honestly uh, like you know recovering from uh, a plane crash where uh, most <laughs> of uh, most of the passengers uh, have survived, and mm-hmm. now we're just walking away. Uh, and, but the thing is, is that we can't go get on a, another plane. We have to rebuild the plane sure. that went down. Sure. So um, anyway, uh, we, uh, you know, one step at a time. And the headlines just keep on coming. Yes. Yes, we're kind of watching it kind of with gritted teeth a little bit because it's all a bit awkward Mm -hmm. but we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on the politics i just want to congratulate you on your new president um but we would love to hear for for the guests who obviously maybe know you um but don't know your background or the guests who don't know you at all it'd be fantastic for you to kind of run us through who you are and what you do really uh absolutely um i uh am an la-based photographer who over the years has spent you know, much of my time uh, tackling uh, editorial assignments, magazine assignments, um, which, because I'm based in Southern California, led to uh, entertainment advertising. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by entertainment advertising, I mean movie posters, um, which are called um, one sheets, television advertising, which is called uh, key art. Um, publicity for the networks networks in the studios mm-hmm. um, and then, um, you know, some advertising work as well. Brilliant. Brilliant. So it's kind of, um, you know, obviously I think if I'm right in saying that you were quite heavily involved with your school paper and stuff. So it's, it goes way back, right? Yeah. My, my first love uh, was um, photojournalism and sports photography. And that's mm-hmm. what I thought. I was going to do. And I, you know, in college, I did a lot of um, news photography. I did a lot of sports photography. And I continued to do that after I had graduated. And then I got a a staff job at what was called Fairchild Publications, which then included Women's Wear Daily, W Magazine, M Magazine. And so I, I still thought of myself as a kind of a freelance 
magazine, newspaper, photojournalist type, but I was starting to expand the genres in which I was working and expanding them into fashion and um, uh, um, still life and travel. And I was, I was really, you know, just starting to widen all of the different genres in which, um, in which I had to work because mm-hmm. on, on any given, on any given day, the assignment might be um, to shoot a party, to shoot a travel story, to shoot uh, gifts, uh, uh, you know, to shoot um, still lives, to do a fashion project. So I became a jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm-hmm. And did you kind of take, well, when the jobs came in, just took everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like to say that I built my career on saying yes. <laughs> and um, actually, um, years ago, my uncle, who was the um, director of, of uh, major gifts in the Stanford University athletic department, you know, told me one of his kind of workflow secrets was that he answered the phone and would say, the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? <laughs> and that was kind of shocking and revelatory to me. And um, I took it really seriously. And um, uh, I can recall multiple times where a magazine would call with an insane uh, request. And I would say, absolutely, yes. And then I would hang up the phone and start thinking madly about, okay, how am I going to get this done? Who do I need to call? How do I break this thing down and make it and make it happen? So with that said, well, I mean, what would you say are kind of the personality traits that you've had to develop? Because it sounds like one of the main ones is is problem solving, I guess. But if you were to say these are the skills it takes to be a successful working photographer these days, um, what did you kind of have to develop as you progress throughout your career? Well, you've answered the question. It is it is problem solving. It is creative problem solving. Um, I've had to learn patience, and I'm still learning that lesson. <laughs> um, I have uh, really developed what I believe to be the balance between the left brain and the right brain. And I will actually tell people that I approach every one of these projects on two parallel tracks, the uh, aesthetic creative track and the logistical um uh, getting it done track and trying to figure out where those two things, uh, intersect. Um, Mm -hmm. I was on a two hour creative zoom call yesterday with a client for, uh, an upcoming shoot in New York city. And I, I had to keep going back and forth between how can we make this thing look the way you want it to look? And what's it going to really take to get the job done? Should we be in a studio? Should we be on location? Um, If we're in a studio, should we be doing green screen or should we shoot a Duratrans in the background? So problem solving, patience, um, a a willingness to listen. And and then I I developed years ago um, this idea of trying to optimize my preparation and optimize my flexibility. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean... Um, I try to approach every project, um, being kind of optimally prepared, um, and then being optimally flexible. And I actually came up with these, uh, intersecting bell curves of preparation. Wow. Wow. That is okay. So we might need to explain that to the listener. So we've got at the top there, we've got the maximization of the editorial shoot. And then we have flexibility. What, what are those on the two, two okay, wings so, there? So the extremes on either end of the bell curve are you cannot be inflexible mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. cannot be indecisive, which is mm. why it's a bell curve. And then with preparation, you cannot be underprepared and you cannot be overprepared. And by overprepared, I mean, you know, you can't be a nervous wreck, mm. you know, so I'm just trying to always optimize my preparation because we've all been in this situation. You guys have been in this situation where you, you get to a shoot and you think you know exactly what you're doing. And all of a sudden somebody says, um, okay, well, it turns out you can't shoot here. You have to shoot over there. Mm-hmm. Or you get to the shoot and you're 
you've forgotten a piece of gear, or you get to the shoot and you thought it was going to be sunny and it's raining. So you've got to be able to, you know, move very quickly and solve these, um, the issues that come at you on your, on your feet. Mm. Mm. Was there, was there a particular moment where you kind of realized in your career that you kind of, you were like, right, I need to be that guy that needs to create diagrams of bell curves <laughs> because I've, I've either had something that's, you know, gone wrong, lost a bit of kit, or, you know, I need to kind of be very logical about how I lay this out. Um, that's a really good question. And, you know, the, the part of me that actually draws it and creates the bell curve is the part of me that is lecturing and teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I started to, you know, on every single shoot, when you were starting your career or you, all three of us have hit these, oh crap, I didn't bring the beauty dish. Okay, I've got to figure out something else. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, this thing is broken. Or, um, you know, back in the day, the sink cord, the famous sink cord yep. <laughs> didn't sink. Um, you know, so, you know, even if it comes down to, okay, the pocket wizards are out of batteries, do we have any backup batteries? You know, like, mm. so then, you know, I just started to back out of the problems and try to build in um, some kind of organization and structure so that we could be prepared for every eventuality. Because I remember specifically getting in the car with my first, my longtime first assistant and dear friend, Elaine Brown, and, you know, we coming off of a shoot where there had been some unforeseen problem. And I'd say, well, we didn't see that coming. And so I would come back to the office and try to figure out how could we avoid that thing or mitigate the possibility mm -hmm. of that thing happening again. Mm. Yeah. And here's, here's the famous one, which is you've got to take a nine foot seamless to the 14th floor. Okay, so um, how do we know if it's going to fit in the elevator? Just right out of the gate. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, I need to know not only the dimensions of the elevator, I need to know Pythagorean's theorem. Mm, right. That thing is going in at an angle. Because we've all gotten to the, to the building and brought the seamless and hadn't even thought Oh, mm. seamless might not fit in the elevator. Is there a freight elevator? No. How's the stairwell? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I've actually had that exact same situation. It didn't fit in the elevator, and we, we then had to pass it up. We had three people passing it up through the center part of the uh, the stairway. Been there, done that. Fun, right? <laughs> it's my favorite, right, that, favorite part of the it, job. It, that's the thing, is that we are all in the business of making beautiful imagery, um, but the, the dirty little secret is that there are all of these kind of pre-production and to some extent post-production factors that go in to making that imagery when you're doing, um, you know, this kind of work. It, I, I'm not saying that, you know, you don't have to be prepared to be a nature photographer, a landscape photographer, a sports photographer. You absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so to me, you know, preparation and flexibility are just absolutely huge. Quickly, I know we're going to di kind of diverse from what we we're kind of planning and talking about. We, me and Greg also love preparing, right? I'm sure if there was a doomsday, we would be preppers, you know, we'd have our full kit bags. But we've both, me and Greg, have got, you know, quite large kit bags full of bits that you will never need. I think the weirdest thing I've got in my in my kit bag is things like waterproof matches, you know, I very rarely need to set fires on shoots, but I do have them in case we're ever outside in the field and need to set a fire. Is there kind of anything that you've found over the years that I, I assume you've kind of, you know, obviously I've seen the, the behind the scenes that you post up on your Instagram. You have huge amounts of kit that comes out to the shoots. Is there a box full of really useful bits that gets loaded out for every shoot that's probably never needed, but it's got, I don't know, you know, blue tack or a, a very strange bit of kit in there that it's used once in 15 years 
Velcro zip ties, things like that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Over the years, your grip bag has changed. You know, mm -hmm. my kit bag has changed. And um, the, the, my longtime first uh, slash executive producer, now agent, whom I mentioned earlier, um, is actually Irish. So she taught me the term bits and bobs. Oh, and right. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to kind of minimize the bits and the bobs. And also, if you know, I went into the garage and brought that kit out, you'd see that it is labeled within an inch of its life because I'm not the guy going in there necessarily, mm -hmm. yeah. the assistant or the intern. So I want that thing to be bulletproof. So when I ask him to go get, to answer your question, the turkey bags. Okay. I, I mean, I have got no idea where you're going with this, but please continue. Um, <laughs> and here's the other one that you will, you guys will love is um, the closet bar hanger plates. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with the turkey bags. So, when you put a turkey in the oven, mm -hmm. um, in order to seal in the juices, they sell these cellophane bags that can withstand 450, 500 degrees. Right. Um, those are fantastic to put over your strobes in the rain. Yeah. Genius. Because okay. <laughs> no worries about heat. Yeah. Learned, learned that from an assistant in Seattle. Uh, which is, I believe, the London of... Um, yeah, very rainy. Yeah, very and, uh, rainy. We've got turkey bags in the, um, in the kit. How the, yeah. Um, I don't see you guys writing that down. Um, <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry. We've, we've got show notes. Okay, <laughs> we'll so link. <laughs> when you walk into your closet, there's a bar on which you hang your shirts and jackets. Mm -hmm. The bar is sitting in a essentially a horseshoe metal plate all right mm -hmm. and that horse metal plate is round and it's uh got a circle that is incomplete right right um and it's got holes so that you can drill it into the wall mm -hmm. okay if you ever need to lock down your tripod very good there so you can very very long Sorry, yeah, it's uh, it's quite late in the day here. I was busy too, right? was too busy writing down turkey bags. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Here's the thing, and, and there's another little secret, is that most of the great bits and bobs aren't at the camera store. They're no, DIY at the store. marine supply store. Yeah, yeah. You know, like there's that great folding cart that it, it's called a folded cart. Mm -hmm. It's at the marine supply store. And, and it's, it's literally it's probably not got the photography markup on it. It's probably like 40 bucks, that, right? That's exactly right. And I've seen those, I've seen those in Miami on the beach, you know, with photographers. And I used to take one with me all the time um, when I was doing, you know, that kind of like running around location work. So anyway, um, yes, you can go to the photo store and get lost. Um, and I do highly recommend it, but, you know, go to the outdoor um you know, REI or Patagonia store, mm -hmm. you know, go to the, um, go to the Marine supply store, um, go to, you know, Home Depot to the hardware store. Um, and I, you know, I had no idea that this podcast was gear talk, but I'm, oh, I'm game. I, it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a little bit geary and I, and I don't know. And for, for the English guests, this is going to come across very odd, but I quite like dicks. Right. So mm. now, 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 yeah. I have to kind of qualify this. And you know what? I don't discriminate. No, and I and I appreciate that. My wife uh, is is a, probably a bit unsure where I'm going with this. But for the listeners who have maybe haven't been to the states or hasn't spent much time in the states, Dick's is Dick's an outdoor sport. sports store, right, in the states. And I absolutely love going in and picking up weird bags, mm -hmm. kind of cable not cable ties like uh, carabiners, kind of all. Oh, stuff like that and uh, you know uh, there's a huge amount of uh, dick stuff in my um in my get in my kit bag huge amount oh my god what a great quote that is <laughs> you know for the <laughs> <of> dicks. general <laughs> um if you love dicks you know tune in to the exposed negative 
That, yeah. That's it. I think that's, you know, uh, that is, if you don't mind us using that line, we'll, we'll roll with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you might even get a sponsorship. Do you know what? If we were sponsored by Dix, that would be, that would be excellent. I would, I'd be very happy. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. anyway. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, we'll, we'll talk on a lot of gear. There's, there's quite a lot of gear, kind of gear talk, because we, we quite like, you know, the, the kind of the problem solving, the figuring stuff out. Love the tip about locking the tripod down. But going back mm. to your kind of personality traits and kind of uh, things like that have kind of helped you through your career. Has there been one other kind of one particular trait that you found most useful? And like, if you were going to have like a self-help book, you know, what, what would you kind of call it? Well, the, the self-help book is um, a creative problem solving um, for the um, creative pro problem solving for the professional photographer. Um, I, I think the through lines for me are um, creative problem solving, a willingness to try anything, mm -hmm. uh, a willingness to um, you know, give anything uh, a shot. Um, and, and then also, um, the, you know, the ability to left brain and right brain, this thing, mm -hmm. uh, is, has been incredibly beneficial. Um, uh, and, and you know what, honestly, curiosity, you know, I think curiosity is huge. Mm -hmm. Um, curiosity about, people, curiosity about the light, curiosity about geography, um, curiosity about how things work. I think curiosity is a good one. And that's it. That's an interesting one because curiosity can, um, can diminish kind of as you get further into your career, there are less surprises. You probably find yourself coming up against less kind of problems that you have to deal with because you've dealt with so many in the past. So is mm. there, is there, um, how do you kind of stay, stay curious? I think in a, in a I weird way. Yeah. You know, it's to me, it's I mean, if you're curious, I'd like to believe that you never lose that sense of curiosity. Mm. Um, I am fascinated by uh, by light. I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by social movements. I'm fascinated by um, uh, economies of scale. Um, here's one that was fascinating to me two weeks ago. Um, and this is part of the. Uh, the the stone in the pond um issues with um the pandemic is that it turns out uh the coca-cola company makes half of its revenue from stadiums and events wow half that yeah that story came out last week so wow. you know um they are about to um cut their product line by 50 percent um so you know, those kinds of, you know, weird um, uh, sociological phenomenon are just fascinating to me. Mm. Mm. God, that's bonkers. Half. Well, Jeez. yeah, think about it. Yeah. Events and stadiums around the world. Mm. Wow. Mm. God, that's that's I, I really kind of feel because there's obviously going to be quite large layoffs there, I assume. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel for those guys. God. Whilst we're, I mean, it's a it's a quick segue into this, I guess. Whilst we're talking about the, the big pandemic in the room, hmm. um, and in terms of kind of where uh, editorial photography is obviously going to be probably quite affected by it, and has been affected by it, and you've had to adapt and to, to be able to continue shooting. Do you see uh, the editorial mark uh, the market kind of transitioning into something else? And do you feel like the pandemic might have accelerated any of that change? Um, there's no question. Absolutely no question. And not just the editorial market, you know, every single um, uh, photographic market has been affected in some way. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, the client I was dealing with yesterday, um, you know, just let us know that, you know, their rates are lower than the last time I worked with them. You know, this is a massive um, international no national media company um, that's been consolidating over the last um, and rearranging, um, you know, their organization chart over the last six months, mm -hmm. you know, revenue is down. Um, you know, we merged with um, another media company. How can we streamline our costs? 
So, so yes, um, to the, the changes in the editorial market, which has been going on probably let's be honest for a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, but there have been accelerants. The first one was the advent of digital. Mm -hmm. The second one was the economic collapse in 2008, nine, 10. Um, then there was, um, another kind of wave of digital that forced, uh, more consolidation. Um, uh, and, uh, now this, you know, um, the, the current state we're in, you know, there mm. are fewer magazines. Um, the magazines that do exist have fewer pages and there's a, you know, a call for all kinds of, um, you know, new voices in the editorial world as well, mm -hmm. which is long overdue. Yeah, of course. Yeah. With with the um, kind of in the editorial world, obviously you say that there are less pages, but also there are more outlets. So you're finding yourself being requested to shoot motion as well for for some oh, of these yeah. shoots. Yeah, yeah. Well, so well, the, fee, the, thing. the fee stays it, the same. Yes, the the demands have increased, mm -hmm. and um, the fees have plateaued or gone down. But you are still expected to. Um, produce imagery content for uh, print, motion, broadcast, digital, social. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So five times the amount of content that you're trying to produce for the same amount of money as you were trying to do one shoot for. Absolutely. But, but that was with us before the pandemic. Sure. Yeah, of course. That's the inevitable march of the internet. Yes. But now the pandemic doubles down on that because you may not have the benefit of the pre-light day mm -hmm. uh, or you get your talent for less time or I'm sorry, we can't have that many crew. Sure. Mm. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting one because obviously with your setups, for, for anyone who doesn't follow you, they can follow you at Instagram, right? It's, it's forward slash AS pictures. Is that right? Yeah. Now, uh, you are very generous with your posting of lovely behind the scenes pictures and kind of explanations and, and a lovely shout out to all the crew and stuff like that. With the, uh, you know, say, for example, you may not get access to a pre light day. You, are you have, finding that you're having to kind of work in a different way because you're not able to get these kind of large setups kind of set or are you kind of getting in early to you know that are the days becoming much longer um well that's a negotiation um the the job that we were talking with the client about yesterday there's going to be a pre-light day mm -hmm. but the you know the television network job we did two weeks ago we got in early and then we're, you know, kind of budgeting for overtime for the crew, you know, because the crew is on an eight hour day, a 12, the crew is on a 10 hour day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we go into hour 11 and hour 12, we need to make sure that they're covered in the budget. Sure. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, I've done both, um, uh, pre-light days and more often than not lately, no pre-light days, but the the no pre-light day um i gotta say we had honed our skills years ago in the world of editorial mm -hmm. because the world of editorial you know kind of post 2010 still wanted the big beautiful concepts mm -hmm. but they couldn't afford the pre-light day right so if you look back at you know my instagram and you look at maybe the jamie lee curtis shoot for entertainment weekly where we you know built that front porch mm -hmm. that that's all in one day, you know, and the, the workflow was, you know, get in at seven, um, build, 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 light, 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 break for lunch. Um, and, you know, telling the magazine to tell the talent that they cannot show up until noon or one mm -hmm. and then taking, um, you know, maybe shooting from two to four, one to four and getting everything torn down and getting out of there before you go into overtime. Mm. So our crew and I were already really trained to get it all done in one day, which takes us back to the preparation. Mm -hmm. When when it comes to preparation, obviously it's shoot dependent. For some of these for the, some of these bigger shoots that you do, 
there's obviously a full a full day probably pre prep well pre light on a on a bigger shoot and then you'll have a day of prep with the crew how does it how does it work for you do you normally you'll do a creative call with the with the client or with the you know with the with the talent and then you'll have a, a day kind of prepping or because or, you use the same crew pretty much all the time you do you just because I like talking about relationships so obviously some of these guys you've been working with for years and years do they just know there's some things you don't even need to say they just know straight off the bat yes and no and I think that was six questions so I'm going to try and sorry I do I do do that (laughs) um so let me answer the the what I thought was the first question which Mm -hmm. is that um if they're, regardless of whether or not there's a pre-light, there, there are, there's all kinds of pre-production, you know, and it's not like my pre-production day is Thursday. You know, my pre-production day is every day leading up to the shoot where I might spend a half an hour, an hour, two hours dealing with some aspect of the shoot. Mm-hmm. And given the pandemic, the creative calls and the logistical, the logistical calls um, have, doubled and tripled multiple calls, you know, just multiple calls because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to get tested on X day and you have to arrange the crew to get tested. And, um, uh, you know, I I still want to like go to a scout of the location to understand, um, well, do we need to be tested to go do the scout? So Mm -hmm. pre-production kind of spreads out over, as many of the days before the shoot um, as there are. Mm. Uh, So that's part one. Part two is I, the morning of the shoot, the morning of the pre-light, the morning of the shoot and pre-light will gather the crew and say, this is what we're doing. This is the creative. This is how I think we're going to solve it. The talent gets here at one. We have to be done lighting at 12. We have to be like, I give them all of the parameters, not three weeks of parameters, but I give them the bullet pointed parameters, mm-hmm. including, including lighting diagrams, you know, including um, this is how I think this set should be lit. Um, and then the flexibility part comes in where um, my crew says, why wouldn't we just, you know, bounce it into the wall? And I'll go, oh my God, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so then your next question is, I'm not always using the same crew, but we have an interchangeable crew of probably 15 to 20, you know, men and women that we're working with on a regular basis who are used to working the way that I work. Mm -hmm. So I come as fully prepared as I can. Um, and then I try to bring them up to speed as quickly as possible Mm. for, you know, 15 minutes so that they know what they're doing and they can anticipate the problems that I think are coming. Mm -hmm. And I can get their input because these guys um, are working on a lot more jobs than I am and may have tackled a problem like this before. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's always nice to get a kind of a, an extra set of fresh eyes, especially if you've been staring at something for all kind of super in depth for, you know, a week or so, you might have missed something because you were thinking about something else. And then someone else will just come in and be like, oh, yeah, but we did this the other week. And you'd be like, brilliant, of course. Exactly. So aside from the the, the turkey bags, I just love the idea of that. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you picked up along the way from an assistant or from your crew that you were like, that is a that is a fantastic lighting trick. Yes, there's too many to mention, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I, I'll I'll give you like a a macro and a micro. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. The macro is the the idea that when you're lighting a scene, it's like cooking, and you're adding one ingredient at a time, mm-hmm. and my kind of go-to workflow is to light from back to front. And that could mean um, putting down the tripod and taking an ambient exposure. Mm -hmm, And just mm -hmm. where does the ambient live? Um, 
Uh, and then, um, then bringing in the edge lights, if there are any, or the hair light, then bringing in the main light, then bringing in the fill light. I think there's, there's too many people that, you know, if they're going to light the background and an edge and a main and a fill will make the mistake of metering everything in, shooting it, and then staring at it and going, hmm, how do we fix that? But if you know, you know, first you add the water, then the salt, then the pasta, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, you've got some control, which is what this whole thing boils down to, over all of these different lighting elements, you mm -hmm. know? And you know that, oh, hey, look, when we added the main, it washed out the background. Oh, okay, so now we have to flag the main or block the main or grid the main or feather mm -hmm. the main. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the macro idea is one, you know, kind of set of lights at a time from back to front. That's a really good one, actually. The micro um, is probably, you know, over the years, trying to find the best possible way to replicate the sun. And, you know, what I've settled on um, is a beauty dish in front of an octobank. Because the sun is remarkable and it is simultaneously sharp and soft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and the other amazing thing about the sun is that it is so far away that it is able to light everything. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you may have to put up your sun and then just kind of wrap the light around to give it that bright, sunny look. Mm. And, and then um, when you go to fill in the sun, um, what I've done been doing lately is using a, a muslin, you know, um, sheet or a, a muslin drop mm -hmm. um, as the fill because it's not, you know, as sharp as a V flat. It's not as sharp as a silk. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as sharp as something white, you know, mm. it, it's more forgiving um, uh, for, uh, for fill. So that's just a couple of um, the, the go-to tricks. Very good. They are great. I mean, shooting in the UK where sun is never going to be the same as it is in LA. <laughs> you, know, so you sort of know how to create a sun, put it that way. Right. And <laughs> like, you know, what's the difference between dusk and noon and, mm. um, you know, or even, you know, let's say that you're in the UK and it's an overcast day and it's supposed to be bright and sunshiny. You know, well, you've got, if you're going to see out the window, you've got to do two things. You've got to throw light through the window. Then you've got to turn around and you've got to throw light on the shrubbery. Yeah. Because you can't just have the sunshine streaming through the window and have everything else outside dark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost that form that you take to lighting that you see on film sets in the same way that DOP begins to look at light and building realistic lighting situations. Have you ever kind of considered a, you know, dabbling in that field? A side hustle. Yeah. A side hustle. Um, you know, over the years, um, and I'm still thinking about it. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, I'm being asked, we're all being asked to, you know, DP and, um, or, you know, do motion. And, you know, the, the more well-versed you are, you know, um, the better off you're, you're going to be so mm -hmm. that you, know, you can, but, but here's the thing. I, and I, I really do strongly believe this back when, you know, the iPad first came out and we were being asked eight years ago, 10 years ago to do motion and stills. I think we had a choice and the choice was as still photographers, we are both directors and DPs. We are behind the camera dealing with the light and the exposure in the camera and talking to our subjects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that really was driven home for me when I was shooting side by side on a, uh, a television advertising set and the AD from the 
motion side came over and said to me, oh, you're, you're the director and the DP. And I said, yes, I am. So, <laughs> and, um, so when we're asked to do motion, we have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get out the camera or are we going to direct? And I chose to direct mm -hmm. and continue to have the relationship with the talent and hand off the, you know, the, the camera to a DP. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. With the, I'd love to go back to your kind of preparation uh, side of things. So obviously it's a huge part of, of shoots for, for everyone as well as yourself. Do you think there's kind of been, I don't know how, uh, obviously we've seen your graphs, your, your bell chart, very impressive. Um, but has there, has there been kind of a part, uh, maybe a piece of software or a piece of hardware that's kind of really helped you, uh, you know, keep the studio organized or kind of help you prep for shoots? Absolutely. 10,000%. Yes. <laughs> um, the Holy Trinity for me mm -hmm. is, um, busy Cal. The calendar. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and um, not just, you know, putting stuff on the calendar, but in the notes section of the calendar, listing um, all of the crew that we have reached out to, mm -hmm. you know, or um, putting in the directions, you know, in the cat, like using the notes section of the calendar. Mm -hmm. Right. Huge. Um, number two is um, DF Studio mm -hmm. from uh, the company in uh, Culver City called Digital Fusion. And DF Studio has, um, uh, they are storing and giving me access to every single file from every single shoot. So, you know, if you were to say to me right now, um, you know, and we were screen sharing, um, you know, show me the, Jamie Lee Curtis files, mm -hmm. I can log into my account and within 30 seconds have access to every single one of those files. Mm. And that is huge, mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. huge. Um, and all of those BTS images that you see on my Instagram, those are in that job. Mm -hmm. so I can go into that job and go, wait, how did we light that? Oh yeah, we put the thing with the other thing and then there was that thing. So. That's huge. Right. Huge. That's um, brilliant. And that is available to all of your listeners, regardless of their um, zip code or uh, language of origin. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the third part of the, the Holy Trinity is FileMaker Pro. And File, FileMaker Pro is my database software, mm -hmm. uh, which you can buy off the shelf, but then you need some kind of programming experience or a FileMaker expert to custom tailor it to you. Right. Um, and I've been working with a FileMaker guy, wow, for close to maybe 18 years now, mm -hmm. same guy. And I can jump into my FileMaker database, and um, which is now open on my desktop. Um, and there's a, a productions database, a company's database, and a people database mm -hmm. and completely searchable. So it's almost like your CR, your personal CRM that you use. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Oh, now, now you're talking. So me, me and Greg have been talking about CRMs pretty much every day this week. We, we're both in the market for, for choosing a new one. And I like the idea of this. This sounds great. Well, you know, honestly, um, we should, uh, when this is over, um, plan uh, another one of these on Zoom, mm -hmm. not Squad where my face is squished, and, <laughs> uh, and I can screen share and, and show it to you. Yeah, that'd be great. Wow. That'd be great. We appreciate that. Amazing. Yeah, because I find that with the photo industry, a lot of the stuff that's out there, it, it finds it difficult to cope with the type of work that, that certainly myself and Tom are doing. What you're doing is on a, on a totally different level, but um, that idea of uh 
you know, a lot of stuff's marketed for wedding photographers or for portrait photographers who are doing like seniors type of things. And actually the realities of working, doing commercial and editorial and trying to keep astride those two markets, there's not much that knows how to structure that in a way of like, you've got a lead that leads to onto this section, which leads onto this section, which leads onto this section, because it's such a, every job is slightly different. And I feel like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, regardless of what level you think you're at, this comes back to, you know, kind of the overarching idea for me, which is not even about preparation and flexibility. The overarching idea here is that we are professionals, you know, and, you know, the story I told you about, you know, the, the zoom quality and the photographer not getting considered, you know, because of, you know, the, the quality of their zoom, Mm -hmm. um, it speaks to professionalism. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Again, regardless of the level, you know, I'm looking at the database now, just being able to search and find, like I can, you know, in my, in my, in my people database, I can click on find. And if I have called somebody a photo assistant, like their label is photo assistant in, you know, Chicago, mm-hmm. I can, you know, click on photo assistant Chicago and up come Let's take a look. Uh, photo assistant Chicago. Um, up come the five photo assistants that we have used in Chicago. Right. That was that was seven seconds and three clicks. Mm-hmm. You know? So wow. regardless of the kinds of things that you're shooting, mm. this allows you the freedom mm-hmm. to um, you know be able to work very very quickly because you know our, our clients are not getting more patient. Uh, um, no. and you want to be the the person mm-hmm. that has the answers you know absolutely so, you know your client could you know say um wh- what was the name of that location we shot at four years ago and you go boom you know um or uh you know what was the um what was the budget on that shoot mm-hmm. last year it's right. It's all right there. And you can put and, it all yeah. up. Yeah, it's all part of you know caring yourself, um, seeing yourself, um, and showing the world that you are a professional. Mm-hmm. And that, that for me is honestly the the primary overarching idea here. You know, are you taking yourself seriously as a working photographer, and what does that mean? I always feel like we, as time has kind of gone on and, you know, it's becoming harder and harder, we, without a shadow of a doubt, it is becoming harder to earn a living as a photographer. Uh, no question. As the market changes and things like that. I do feel that we can maybe be a little less arty. I think maybe we, the people who aren't good at business might kind of fall by the wayside a little bit. I think you now it's absolutely imperative to have some sort of kind of business acumen around it because it's as the budgets have got smaller, the the chances of you being able to do one or two big jobs a year and just survive off that and go around shooting whatever you want. That's actually very few and far between. I think now you have to really be on it. Yeah. There, you know, we're, we come back to the left brain, right brain discussion Mm -hmm. and whether it's you or your agent or your studio manager, or your partner, or your brother, or your father, uh, or your mother, or your sister, um, you know, somebody needs to be minding the store, Mm. you know, literally minding the store. Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, you know, one of the other kind of pillars of this uh, idea uh, for me um, was when I realized that there are uh, really just four aspects to our business. And there aren't three and there aren't five. There are four. Uh Uh-huh. And again, for our listeners, there's a fantastic diagram. Look at that. Four components of freelance photography. I can't... So is that image management at the top? Archive, finances, and just off the bottom of the screen... Production. 
production. There, it's sharp, right? There we go. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, perfect. It looks like you're wearing it as a hat now, though. <laughs> there, <laughs> yeah. it's a very snazzy <laughs> hat. <laughs> and, you know, if you if you write this if you write this down, and you start to appreciate how your productions feed your finances, your productions feed your marketing, your productions feed your archive. Your mm-hmm. archive feeds your marketing and your archive can feed your finances. And you start to realize that all of these things are um, uh, helping each other. And when I figured this out, then I realized that you cannot let any one of these four things fall by the wayside. Mm-hmm. Every day you have to address in some way your shoots, your marketing, your archive, or your bank account. Um, and you know, too many you know young photographers, you know, um, think that they're going to get into this business and just shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and the truth is that um, you know you just opened a bakery. You I, opened a bakery. I did. There I you actually go. Did. No. There you go. And the. Um, you know, the production is the baking mm-hmm. and the uh, finances are the till and the marketing is, you know, um, whether it's your Yelp reviews or, you know, what you know, literally, um, you know, your marketing and then your archive is your day old bread. Mm. It's that it's really that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really have to appreciate that. That's what you're that's what you're doing. Yeah. That's a really nice that, way of that's a really nice way of putting it. Sorry, Greg, go on. You're full of good analogies. I like this. Well, if if listeners want to, um, obviously, you do do a bit of teaching um, and lecturing. Do you do any of that? Is that all? Well, I guess not in uh, at the moment. It's probably not in person. But is that normally in person, or can people um, sign up to anything that you do? What's What's really fantastic, and I put that in air quotes about the pandemic, is that. Um, you know, I'm doing uh, a lecture for the um, uh, APA and ASMP chapters in um, New England mm-hmm. virtually. I just did the Palm Springs Photo Festival virtually. Um, RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology, just asked me to do a lecture virtually. So um, it, it enables me to. Um, you know, to reach people who, um, you know, might not be able to get on a plane and go to the Palm Springs Photo Festival, which, by the way, is just absolutely fantastic. And I've actually met photographers from, you know, Ireland and the UK mm-hmm. uh, at the PSPF. Um, and that the Palm Springs Photo Festival just happened. It got postponed from May to uh, the first week of October. But but yes. Um, and all of those lectures are um, are on my website. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Amazing. Okay. Well, we will link to that in the show notes. Absolutely. Um, Tom, do you have any further questions or do we jump on to our... I mean, the thing is, I, I would love to speak I've to you. I've got too many questions. I've got so, I've got so <laughs> many questions. I mean, I, I've been following you a long time and... We both have, yeah. The stuff... Well, sorry. Yes, we both have. Don't mean to talk you down, Greg. Sorry. We we have all learned. Everyone learns so much from behind the scenes posts, and, and yours are yours are fantastic. Do well, let me want to talk you the way that you talk through each and every element in them is just like yeah. So so amazing. for people that haven't seen them, go and check them out on the Instagram. It's the Instagram. I sound like such an old man. Oh, go on the internet and check them out on the Instagram. Um, the World no, Wide Web. But no, uh, it's it's really interesting because I know a lot of people will put up uh, behind the scenes and be like, oh, you know, this is what we did. But actually, you really go through in great detail and explain why you've done it. And this is this is kind of an interesting point because I don't think it's actually in the same spirit that we started this podcast is we Mm. wanted to try and open up what is, what is traditionally, I think quite a closed box really in photography. I think, you know, if you'd said 20 years ago that you'd be showing every single setup well not every single setup, but like a lot of these setups, people would say you're mad. Um, And, you know, we're doing this podcast and hopefully people are learning stuff from it. Um, but I think now very much 
as fees have dropped and as it is becoming harder to become, you know, earn a living as a photographer, I feel, and I don't know if you agree and I don't know how it is in the States, but I feel as if we are kind of starting to kind of club together a little bit and it's starting to become, obviously it's horribly competitive. It always will be, but it's becoming a little nicer. People are happy to share because sharing's caring. And I don't know how, is that, is that how it is? Is that how you kind of feel about it? Um, I, I do. Um, I, I've seen, um, I, I have seen that, but, but here's the thing. I've always done that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, um, one of the most popular, um, uh, Instagram feeds for this kind of thing is, um, ISO 1200, Yeah, you know, um, and, uh, you know, they've just, I think quadrupled their following, you know, over the last couple of years. Um, and it's photographers from all over the world that are sharing, you know, what they're doing. And, and the, the questions I get asked about the Instagram feed the most are, do you write that yourself? <laughs> they are, yeah. they are quite, they are quite in-depth captions to be fair. The answer is yes. And, you know, then the next question is, you know, how can you be giving away all that information? And I say, th the answer is that there are so many uh, factors that go into a successful shoot and Instagram is not really the place to talk about marketing and client relations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I certainly can't be disrespectful of my clients or my subjects no, on course. Instagram. Um, so I'm not addressing every single solitary issue, mm -hmm. um, but I am, you know, talking about the light and I'm not even talking about, I don't even necessarily say, you know, the beauty dish was a stop over the silk with the soft boxes behind it, you mm -hmm. know, because, but you know, when I lecture, I do. Sure. But Instagram just isn't, uh, the place for that. Um, and, and the Instagram actually grew out of my, my lectures because my lectures were, um, taking people through all of the behind the scenes and asking all of their questions, mm -hmm. um, answering all of their questions. Um, because you know, there's stuff you just can't learn unless you're on the job. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't learn it in school. You can't learn it in a book. You can't learn it, um, even necessarily on YouTube. You know, you've got to get out there and experience it. And, um, you know, I never assisted and I didn't go to photography school and I learned by asking questions. You know, I learned by, um, uh, you know, just calling people up and, um, you know, or sending them, you know, an email and saying, you know, how did you do that back yeah. in the day? And I just really wanted to pass that along. So, I mean, one thing we, we occasionally bring up on this podcast with some of our guests as a kind of final question is, well, before the penultimate, sorry, the penultimate question, not the final question. <laughs> um, I'm not I'm the classic photographer. Just one more shot. Just one more. Um, uh, where do you, <laughs> with everything that is, you know, the way things are going, um, do, where do you, do you see like in the, the anything, in the future of photography that you're particularly excited by? Because obviously we can't know what we can't know. We, we wouldn't necessarily have predicted Instagram before it came around and what that would mean for, for sharing behind the scenes and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a difficult question to ask, but are you fairly optimistic that technologies and, and things progressing in the future will actually really keep this kind of industry, if not, you know, it will evolve obviously, but are you optimistic? Are you excited about what the future holds for photography or are you? Um, <laughs> the answer is yes, you know, because I, I am, and it, you have to be an optimist. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And you also have to, uh, you know, the word, uh, the, the buzzword, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic was pivot. You know, you have to be able to, you know, pick up, um, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, different skills that you didn't think you really would have to. Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> It's funny because, you know, I was watching MSNBC the other night uh, with my daughter and uh, an advertisement came on for a home alarm security system. And she recognized a friend of ours in the ad 
And then I realized, and he's a photographer, that another mutual friend of ours um, had shot the ad. And I talked to the guy who shot the ad last night, and it turns out that the ad was shot on Insta- on uh, sorry, on an iPhone. And I just thought, oh, wow. Wow. Mm. Wow. You know, this was a broadcast television ad shot on an iPhone and shot remotely during quarantine. Mm. That's problem solving. That's adaptation. Um, mm. And uh, it, it, that takes us back to the to the top of this podcast, which is adaptation, problem solving, uh, preparation, flexibility, um, not digging in your heels, rolling with the punches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think all of those things are absolutely key. So the answer is yes, I'm optimistic. Good. Amazing. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Well, listen, we yeah. tend to kind of finish up all of our shows. Well, I tend to. This is the format. <laughs> We're sticking to it. Um, we ask our guests if they have got – so you're stranded on a desert island. You have got one camera and one photo book. What do you think your co- your choice of camera would be? Bear in mind, I should also say, for, for the sake of listening, uh, there is a photo lab in case you choose to oh, take, take a film cam. Lab on the island. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, well, do I? Can I have a tripod? Um, I, I, I think you could. Yeah, why not? I, I, you can get away with that. I got to be honest and, and say that I really, really, really do miss uh, the Pentax 6.7. I really mm. miss. Yes. Brilliant. I really miss the big negative, um, the big chrome. I miss the depth of field falling off. Mm-hmm. Um, I I miss. And you miss the you know, sound? I miss the big clunking sound. Yeah. Um, and what I loved about that camera is that you could hold it like a 35 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the shoot because uh, that was my go-to medium format camera. And I remember the shoot where, you know, two of my assistants said, dude, we got to switch to the RZ. I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> and I switched to the RZ. Um, but God, the the flexibility of that camera. Um, oh my God! They don't make wooden handles like that anymore, oh do they? God, the wooden handle, the, the the ninety millimeter lens that wasn't a one ten, and it also wasn't the seventy five. <laughs> who, who makes that lens anymore? Um, Oh my God! Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. perfect. Yes. They did make. Okay, they did can... make. They did have a history. Pentax, uh, Pentax Asahi. I know. I've told this story in the podcast before. I don't know if you know it. They they did make kind of cameras with slight kind of funny traits. You know, have you ever heard of the SP five hundred? Little thirty, think... little thirty five mil silver silver uh, SLR. They also did an SP one thousand. Right, and the the five hundred and the one thousand refers to the very top shutter speed. So the one thousand was the pro model, right? Now the five hundred is the exact same camera, but if you turn the dial one more stop past five hundred, the thousand shutter speed is there. They just, just not marked. Just not marked. <laughs> Fantastic. So I don't know. Fantastic. There's just some and character that, missing from the photo industry. That, that is actually one of the great crimes committed against professional photography that really wasn't um, uh, committed against the other recording um, media Mm -hmm. when they went digital. Um, And and here's what I mean. When, When photography went digital, we went from, let's just call it 78 different film stocks to um, Canon, Nikon, Hasselblad, Sony, Mm -hmm. you know, to four different chips. Mm. And we went from having all kinds of different camera options, you know, uh, the Roly, the Pentax, um, the Mamiya, to basically having, you know, two or three cameras to Mm. deal with. And we went from having multiple ways to process your files to Photoshop, which is... I know an infinite number of ways to finish your files, but we were definitely, when we went digital, um, we lost a whole lot of tools and all of us have been spending years trying to recreate the look of, Mm -hmm. we lost a lot of magic. Yeah. Those film stocks. Mm. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. 
And that didn't happen to the music industry and it didn't happen to the motion picture industry, but it happened to us. And you think Pentax, <laughs> Pentax just got lost? I heard that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very valid. Very valid. Criminal. Yeah. Criminal. So the sand is in your toes. The water is washing up onto your feet. You're stood on the beach. Your favorite photo book that you're struck on this bloody island. <laughs> you want some inspiration. What are you gonna what are you gonna delve into? Well well, here's the thing. I've got an extensive library of photography books. And and it it's become so we just about a year and a half ago remodeled our living room. Everything's up on the wall. It used to be in piles, and now I can see everything, and I'm just terrifyingly intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> pick one up. Um, and it would be too easy to say, um, you know, uh, well, uh, Abaddon, uh, the American West, um, because it's so um, brilliant, but limiting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just flip the table and say that I would probably want to take, you know, Susan Sontag's on photography, um, where you have to think about photography mm -hmm. and not just mm. and not just look at pictures, mm. you know. Great book. And just go back to thinking about it and thinking mm. about it and challenging yourself, um, because if if you if you say, oh, Abaddon, oh, um, you know, uh, no, um, the Decisive Moment book, or um, you know, one of the great photojournalistic anthologies, like then you're left with phenomenal images, but you're left with phenomenal images. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to take a book like, you know, Sontag's and, you know, just make you think, I think, you know, if the sand's in my toes, that's probably the better call. Brilliant. I think that's the uh, best answer we've had for that so question. It's a, it's a pretty good answer. <laughs> pretty good answer. Well, listen, Art, where can people find you online? Um, Artstriver.com, AS Pictures on Instagram, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out there. I'm findable. Yeah, <laughs> you are quite, Excellent. you are quite findable. Well, listen, thank you so, so much for coming on and taking the time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah. thank you guys. Uh, my apologies again for the miscommunication about the time zone thing. And um, we, ha we hadn't even mentioned it. The listeners won't even know. Yeah. And I <laughs> say, you know, for the listeners who can't see Tom, uh, he's driving a Sony A5100, um, <laughs> and he is so sharp, um, and his light is spectacular as well. Uncomfortably sharp. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> so there. <laughs> oh, dear. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Art. All right, you guys. My pleasure. Thank you very much for listening to the latest episode. Uh, if you'd like to read more about the episode or see the show notes, you can go over to the website, which is exposednegative.com. And to get in touch with us, there's a myriad of options. So you can either email us at info at exposednegative. You can follow us on Instagram at xnegative. We're on Twitter as well. But also, if you'd like to follow us personally, I mean, why wouldn't you? We're at, at tombarns.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M. And we're at Greg Fennell, which is G-R-E-G, -E obviously, uh, F-U-N-N-E-L-L. -L. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to, uh, well, we won't see you on the next one, but hopefully you enjoy listening to it.